So good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Here we are for another World War II TV live stream. Joining me from England is Mark Forsdyke, the author of the excellent book that I ordered three weeks ago, but like a bastard, it only turned up yesterday, fighting through to Hitler's Germany about what 1st Battalion Suffolk Regiment, 44 to 45. Um, good afternoon, Mark. Excited? Yeah, a bit nervous, though. Oh, <laughs> uh, well... We can't be as nervous as those blokes were in the Suffolk Regiment 76 years ago. So, um, you know, no one's going to shoot at us. No, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I made you feel, put you in your place there. And we've got our, our dream team camera team of Mag, my other half, and Duncan out there um, north of Corn Forest. And today we're talking about an event that six, 76 years ago right now was um, well underway. Well, in fact, it was nearing completion. The event actually started just before dawn on the 28th of June, 1944. So we're going to take you back to those events um, when we start with our introduction shortly. But a bit of uh, background first. And the background we'll start with is on the 26th of June, uh, 1944, Operation Epsom had started. I'll just bring a map up. And Operation Epsom was the breakout by um, the 15th Scottish, notably, across towards the Odon Valley. Oh, you can see my mouse down here. This is off uh, west and south of Con. We're not dealing with that today. We're dealing with the action over here in the top right corner where the British 3rd Division were up here north of Caen. Um, and uh, the panic, I suppose you'd call it, amongst 21st Panzer. Our, our protagonists today are 21st Panzer, and they've been holding this area here around Caen since June the 6th when they counterattacked towards Sword and Juno beaches. And now with things happening here near the Odon, they're getting a bit jumpy. That's a bit of an understatement. And now to show you exactly where we are, I'll go to Google Earth image and Google Earth image number one is this one. And um, this is, sorry, that's the wrong one. That's, that's number two. They're going back to the previous one. There we are. Here is Caen, the, the modern city. This is obviously a modern image. Sword Beach is up here with Wiestraham, the ferry port for those who've come over on a ferry from England. It's over here. And the area we're dealing with today is just north of Epoch, just north of Caen here. And there's a main road that runs up north to, towards Mathieu and up towards Douvre de Livron and indeed Juno Beach. And this is one of the axes of advance the British have been trying to use for a few weeks, really. And then there's the road through uh, Beville, Bouville over here. And then I'll move to the closer up map. And this is our little our, our, our arena today. And then I'll bring in the camera view. So um, this is Le Londel or Le Landel. It's spelt in two different ways in the books. It's just one of those annoying things. But on the Google Earth, it's Londel. In Mark's book, it's Landel. In the wartime account, it's Landel. Although Landel in French is pronounced Londel. So it's all the same thing anyway. And Duncan, our cameraman number one, is... Um, uh, it's giving us the German point of view. He's over this area here. And Mag at the start line is over here. And then I'll bring Mark in very shortly to talk about what's going on. So let me start with um, Mag's view of um, towards towards Con. Now, the big building over in the rear there, that's our uh, indicating marker for those watching it. That is the shoe, the hospital in Con, the CSU. Um, and it's a 19-story building. That's kind of our guideline as to where Caen is. And if now Mag swings around to the right slightly, and that's Mag zooming in on it for us there, Mags. And then when we get to uh, about a little bit more there, that is the wooded Chateau de la Lande. And in a very, very short time, I'll let Mark explain what's been going on there. And I'll just cut to Duncan to show the reverse view. Duncan is in a hedgerow opposite Mag, and that tree line in the distance there is where Mag is. So that is a, it's I guess about a sort of three or four minute walk across there. I'm not sure the distance in yards, but it's a fair distance. And of course, this is June to 28, 76 years on, the corn or wheat, as you prefer, depending on your nationality, is about two foot high, just as it would have been 76 years ago in these fields, or some of the fields around here, some were, were pasture, some were, were wheat. Um, so Mark, um, the Chateau de la Londe, uh, Londel for the Suffolks is a, a, a major, major stepping stone in their battle in Normandy and something that when you were doing your book, you spent a lot of time and you devoted an entire chapter to it. Um, so it, it's, it's a pretty big one, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's um, well in, in terms of um, killed, wounded and captured, it's the most costly of the entire Northwest Europe campaign. Um, the, the, the first battalion has had a, a relatively, dare I say, easy first day um, during the campaign. It had, um, it had managed to come ashore off the beaches. It had taken the village of Colville and um, the bunker complex at, at Hillman with a minimum of fuss. Um, it had then spent the days after D-Day over at Lemesnil Wood, um, where it had been pretty much under constant shell fire. But then they get the orders on the 27th to move up to, uh, to La Landel for the attack on the Chateau d'Alons. The, um, the South Lanks, who were in the same brigade as them in 8th Brigade, um, 3rd, 3rd British Infantry Division, they'd had a crack at it twice. They'd gone in on the, uh, on the 21st um, and they'd held it for the best part of four or five days. Um, but the Germans were increasingly building up more and more against them. They were booted out um, early on the 26th and they decided to put in the second attack to try and recapture it on the 27th. But by that time, the Germans had got so much uh, supporting armour and uh, reinforcements up that it was a pretty much impossible nut to crack. So um, the South Flanks withdrew and, as they say, third time lucky, the job gets given to one Suffolk. And one Suffolk are, are moved up to, um, to La Landel late on the 27th, where, um, where the operational orders are received. And um, the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Kit Goff, um, he then calls all the officers together in a barn. Um, the accounts of two hurricane lamps sitting on the floor and all the fellas um, huddled around in the, in, in the darkness to receive the orders. Um, it was to be a two company attack, uh, B and C company, B on the right, C on the left, would advance over the open field as you've, you've seen there towards the, the wall of the Chateau d'Arlande. It, it was B company's responsibility to to get in and to take the area immediately behind the chateau and C Company want to take the field at the rear. Um, there was a belt of barbed wire that divided the two, um, a sort of um, 18 to 20 yards thick, um, but past the chateau in the area of La Pomeraire, there, um, there was a lot of German um, vehicles, particularly some half tracks that were, were deemed unserviceable. They've been observed for the best part of two or three days. Um, but they were mainly turned into sort of static gun positions. So the guns were still being used, even though they couldn't be driven. Um, but that's really where, where it all sort of starts. So where you can, where you can see on the, on the film at the moment, we're looking across towards what would have been C Company's positions at the back end of the chateau. And if you gently swing the camera a little bit to the right, you'll have the whole sort of field of wh where one suffered were advancing. Um, and that, it, and I'll just show Duncan's view there as well, because Duncan's showing back you can just see in the in the rear there. That's part of the stone wall. No, you've gone wrong way. Other way, Duncan. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. That's the stone wall. The shadow. And Duncan's been making his way over there as the, as this as this show goes on. And it's like most chateaus in the area. It's it's surrounded by a wall, and um, yeah. even the often it surrounds the villages as well. And uh, we sh we should have also mentioned that the both farms, the the La Londe and Le Londel, are on a, a salient. You can't really see it on the. Uh, on, on Google Earth, but if I go back to the, that photo again, now this area around here is kind of on a ridge. If I show Mag's view again, um, you can see that if there wasn't a salient there where that wood is, we'd be able to see Caen beyond us. And when Mag drives uh, uh, south later on, you'd be able to see across the Caen, but that chateau there is sitting on a, a ridge of high ground. I mean, not particularly much i mean a few meters above what's left and right but just enough to have given the germans this rather commanding position and um we should also mention the east yorks are involved over to the suffolks on their right and stuart robertson who's another tour guide was chatting to me a couple of days ago he's taken members of the east yorkshire regiment to this area uh for their involvement which began also they were supporting and involved with the south lanks attack and they were on the right of the Suffolk for this, but we are going to focus focus on one Suffolk simply because within the constraints of one show, it's all we kind of got the time for. But this is actually an eight, the Eighth Brigade are all involved in the battle for this chateau at various points over several days. But I'll I'll hand back to Mark to uh, to to continue where he was with the uh, the, the activity on the morning of June the twenty eighth. So seventy six years ago to the day. Okay, so. Just, just returning to the to the uh, to the O group order that came the night before, um, both of the assaulting company commanders. So that was B, B company, who was um, Major McCaffrey, and T company was Major Boycott. They both asked for armoured support, 
they, they, they'd seen the, um, the South Lanks attacks in the previous days and decreed that really they needed some armoured support. But unfortunately, the armoured support was not available. They were told it, it couldn't come up. And when you get further into the battle and we look at it, you'll see probably just how ineffective it would have been to put tanks into such a small confined area of the grounds of the Chateau. But the big thing really is the initial advance, the initial advance which you've got to cover across that field to actually get to the Chateau's wall itself. It's about 500, 550 yards. And what would happen is there would be a creeping barrage, a creeping barrage that would start after, after eight minutes of explosion at, um, at 4.15 in the morning. And the creeping barrage was meant to be going forward at 100 yards every three minutes, which actually is pretty speedy. E even for Second War technology, you know, that's pretty speedy advance. So the fellows have really got to keep up right behind it as they go. So early in the morning, the, the two assaulting companies are brought into position. About one o'clock in the morning, the rations come up. So the ration tins are opened and, and the chaps are given the, the tins to spirit away in packs. A lot, of, a lot of the chaps sort of ate biscuits and things like that got ready. But at, at eight minutes past four in the morning, that's when the big main allied bombardment commences. And at quarter past four in the morning, just as the dawn is breaking, the, the whistles are blown and B and C Company of One Suffolk set off. And over on the right, so where we're looking right now, we're on the right hand side of the advance. This is B Company's area. So Major McCaffrey is leading the way. He's leading past the wood you can see directly in the middle at the moment. This is, uh, this is Le Petit Land. And the ground in between Le Petit Land and the camera is what was later known as Dead Cow Field. So moving forward, McCaffrey's got two platoons behind him. He's got Lieutenant Evans on the right in 10 platoon. He's got Lieutenant uh, Saunders on the left in, in 12 platoon. And pretty much as soon as they start, the Germans realising that something's going to happen, they lay down uh, a counter barrage and then several, several mortar barrages after that. So what happens is that with all the chaos and confusion, those first initial waves, those two platoons, start to get fragmented. They take a lot of casualties to, to the enemy bombardment. They dare not go any further forward because they're right up against their own creeping barrage. And then in between that, the um, elements of, of second middle sex, the, um, the, the, the machine gunners attached to the brigade, they start opening up and pounding the positions at the chateau as well. So there's an awful almighty din coupled with smoke, shells, all things going off, the confusion starts to, to rain. But pretty much the, the moment they get going off that start line, the casualties start to mount. On, on the, on the left-hand side, C Company are in exactly the same position. Major Boycott has got uh, 15 platoon on the right under Lieutenant Wilson. And pretty, pretty shortly, Wilson's, Wilson's wounded badly. He later dies about a month later from his wounds. Over on the left, he's got Lieutenant Woodward. Lieutenant Woodward has got behind him um, 13 platoon. They're following about a bound behind, if as, as close as possible, but not too close to get caught up in it. Um, Lieutenant Buchanan, who's a, who's a Canadian under the Canloan scheme, he, he's commanding a platoon there that's going forward. But pretty much as soon as they get to the edge of Le Petit Land, they realize that actually they've taken a hell of a lot of a pounding. McCaffrey turns round. And he can see that actually there's virtually no one behind him. He looks over to where he expects 12 platoon to be. And all he can see is about a half a dozen men there. So straight away of, of, of one platoon with three sections in it, he suddenly realised he's down almost just to a section of each men. Um, there's a lot of bitter fighting going on along the hedgerow. The, the chaps who've passed down the edge of Dead Cow Field and into Le Petit Land when they get there. The Germans have already started to dig slit trenches there. They're, they're well, well entrenched there. They've got, they've got a fair amount of cover behind the foliage there. And they're firing across through B Company's lines, through, through the, the, the small minefield that divided the, the, the B and C Company. And C Company are also taking the pounding as well. Most of C Company's casualties are coming from German armour and from German units in the field behind um, the Chateau de Lyon. There was a great... Um, conglomeration of lanes there and there was a sunken lane at, at, the, at the back of the chateau where there was at least four or five German half tracks which which were causing sort of terrible terrible fire with self-propelled guns but what suddenly starts to happen in the middle of the field is that the the senior NCOs take over they're assuming command I mean I mean um, Lieutenant Frank Evans is wounded he's wounded his arm is dangling limplessly by his side and he's he's back straight away McCaffrey then realises he's down to about a third, possibly almost a quarter of the strength he should have in his company. So he turns around to try and see if he's second in command. Lieutenant Archdale is behind him because Archdale should be following 
about two bounds behind with 11 platoon. And he looks around and he can't see anyone. He's also got virtually no communication because as he turns around, he's, he's number 18 set operator. Um, um, Private Dix, Arthur Digger Dix, he's already been wounded. So they're reverting back to the old, old um, tried and trusted method of runners. So the runners start um, start going back, but the runners are gradually wounded. And then, as as the accounts say, it's the all too familiar cry of stretcher bearer. And then the stretcher bearers, two, two stretcher bearers of um, Corporal Hume, uh, sorry, Private Hume and Corporal Halls. They're, they're just running the gauntlet under fire to get as many men out as they can. And the situation is the same over in C Company. C, C Company is, is taking a, a hell of a pounding. Um, Charlie Boycott, Major Boycott's wounded um, quite badly in the shoulder and the side, but, but rather than, than leave his positions, he puts, um, he puts Lieutenant Woodward in temporary charge and he walks back himself to get his second in command, which was Captain Ralph Brown. He was another Canadian officer. And he, he basically imparts everything that he knows to Brown before he goes to the regimental aid post. But after about 40, 45 minutes, they're getting close. They're getting close to the Chateau wall. And this is, this is, this is where really the sort of the tough hand-to-hand -hand stuff comes in. There's, there's pockets of Germans. Gonna, gonna, that I'm going to hold you up. I'm going to hold you up for a minute, Mark. And I think we're okay. just going to start um, addressing the German side of things because that's, we always get the questions about the German. And Duncan is just going to show us um, how intimidating the positions can be from the German point of view. He's gone back inside the hedgerow there. Now, he's actually in front of uh, the little, the smaller farm there. So not quite where the main focus attack was going, but it gives a really good example of just how lethal a position like that can be. And, you know, as Mark said, 500 yards of field ahead of you, moving towards that, following that creeping barrage. Was it three, uh, 100 yards every three minutes? Is that right? Yep, every three minutes, yeah. So that's, you know, sort of 15 minutes to cover 500 yards. Well, the the, the 21st Panzer Division uh, archive, Sean Claxton, a friend of mine, was looking into that for me. He said they the Germans say they had only 20 guys defending um, the area, infantrymen, that's Panzer Grenadiers of 5th Company, uh, the uh, 192 Panzer Grenadiers. There are rumours of there some being some engineers in the area as well, a platoon of engineers, but that's uns unsubstantiated. There are three or four tanks hull down, and uh, there's elements of 22nd Panzer Regiment. Now, I just used the expression hull down to, for, for a tank. Now, if, if you're watching this, not not sure what that means. Here's a photo of a 20, 21st Panzer Division uh, Panzer IV hull down near Lebesy Wood in Normandy. Now, the area near the Chateau, of course, has more trees and there's a wall, but that's what hull down means. It means they've got a position either actually dug into the earth or they're using the wheat fields or the corn fields to kind of disguise and keep a low prof profile. But that vicious uh, 75 millimeter gun or whatever the caliber is, depending on the weapon, is there to... to to, to cover an approach and you've got the cracks of machine guns like there as well so that's what we mean by um hull down and as with the german side where mark is rattling off names of the suffolk regiment men involved you know be you know platoon level sergeants with the german side of things of course there's very little information about it so our information of this battle comes almost all from the one side because the german accounts are so minimal but I want to get across to those who've been reading this, and I will let Mark talk in a, again in a minute, that when it sounds like, well, 20 Germans doesn't sound very much, except when you look at the view they've got. And frankly, you could just leave two machine guns covering that field there, and uh, uh, two companies coming across that field are in a whole world of hurt. So it's not the number of Germans, it's, it's their position. And uh, to, to, to quote James Holland, who talks about Normandy a lot, attacking in Normandy is very difficult. And if you're wondering why we're not using air power, and there's an air power special coming on tomorrow evening with uh, three guests, the problem is 500 yards between where the Allies start and where the Germans are is kind of not enough gap to bring in our air power and uh, accurately. Our second tactical air force is there in the skies. What it can do is hit German uh, columns coming up to the front. But the problem is if whistling in Typhoon Squadrons or Spitfires and trying to hit that wood there and not hit the, 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 the Allied soldiers themselves is, is nigh and impossible. So it comes down to, as Mark was saying, artillery, uh, then just bayonets, bayonets fixed, walking across wheat fields uh, towards the enemy. It's not that it's, 
um, a, a, a poor tactic. It's it's the only way we can do it. The, the air power can't be used. We've got this artillery to try and soften up the Germans. But as I say, there's, there's Germans there with their tanks dug in and there's 20 or, or possibly more Germans in that wood. And I will hand back to Mark, having now covered the German side of things a bit. Um, so we were getting up to the point where they're approaching the, uh, the chateau wall and Duncan is now making his way towards that area there. This is now, and by the way, people with Duncan is being a very good boy. He's sticking to tracks. We did a recce up here two or three days ago. So he's not just walking across a field. We're all being very well behaved and, uh, and, and good, good little tour guides. So um, I'll hand back to Mark now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, well this is great because if you hear what you're seeing at the moment, is pretty much what B Company is, it, the route it's following as it's going towards the wall. So the, the Chateau wall itself was probably four or five foot high, but just in front of it was a slight bank. And by the look time- Look at the foxes B in front of me. Sorry to trouble you. Look at the foxes in front of me. Foxes. So the foxes in front. Yeah, two foxes at the end of the track. Them. Just, just, while, you, so just, just while, while you're online, Duncan, while you're talking, you know, you're an ex-infantryman. How exposed do you feel right now standing in that field? <laughs> this isn't a move that you would take, believe you me. This is two foot of corn. I mean, on your belly, trying to reload a Lee Enfield. Your backpack would be showing above the corn. This is nowhere to hide. This is just such an open expanse here. It's and you're unbelievable. What, about it halfway really across now, ish? I am, I am just over halfway across, yeah. yeah. I'll show Matt back to Mag's view again, and then we'll bring back Mark in. But this, for those watching, this is what we're trying to do. It's a combination of, of using the cameras, using Mark, but we don't want these to just be kind of dry lectures. It's got to be interactive with using the ground, using the footage, and seeing, you know, Duncan is an ex-Scots Guardsman, and uh, um, so we're trying to get the, I bring to you this idea of how perilous it is crossing wheat fields like this, even with the artillery support. But the 21st Panzer, have had weeks of getting used to artillery bombardment, so they just knuckle down, go in their fox cells, put their tin lids on, and wait for it to come over. But um, yeah, that's the view there across. You can see the stone wall there, uh, or part of it, and Dunk will take us over there later on. So um, back back to Mark again. So, so when when they're when they're at the um, the chateau wall, they manage to to dig in as much as possible using the bank up to it, but they don't get into the chateau for probably another 20 minutes, half an hour or so, because the fire is so intense. Um, McCaffrey's still with them at this point. He turns around and he realises he's got about 18 to 20 men with him, lining the um, the bank in front of the wall. And um, the chaps at the time remembered it, you know, remembered him sort of calm as if on an exercise, you know, God bless you lads, dig in now before there's another counterattack. So out come the picks and shovels as instinctively soldiers do, and they start to make scrapes and get themselves down as, as best as they can. Um, it's in this area at the time that there's a lot of little sort of private hand-to-hand -hand battles going on. I mean, there's, there's chaps, like, there's an account by um, a soldier called Dickie Lovewell. D Dickie Lovewell, um, he, he, was, um, he was made a prisoner of war, but um, the Germans had got him and his chum, um, you know, with their hands up. But suddenly a comrade popped up from the other side of the bank, shot the German and released the two of them. And this was a sort of action that was going on in sort of 15, 20, 20 foot squares all along that wall and just on the inside. When, um, when they finally get over the wall through, through, through a gap that was made by the shell fire, um, this is when they first start to meet elements of the East Yorks. So the East Yorks that are on their right hand flank, who've had responsibility for the driveway in the front of the chateau, um, that they start to meet a few of those that have drifted ever so slightly off course. And later in, in, the, um, in the battle, they, they agree that rather than pulling together, they'll keep their respective positions. Um, so having got themselves over that chateau wall, got themselves in, then they start to find, as you say, the, the German tanks that are hull down. They, they find the, the, um, the remains of partly dug German slit trenches. And this is where the first real major mortar stomp comes down. So j just as the fellas are over the wall and they're starting to dig in, starting to, uh, to, to fortify the position, you know, to, um, to make, make what they've found a bit deeper, to form a defensive line, the, the Germans send over a, a, a mortar stonk, and that takes out quite a few casualties. Um, in the meantime, um, McCaffrey's realising with, with, with nobody there um, behind him that he really needs some reinforcements. If he's going to have to hold this, this, these grounds to the northern edge of the chateau in any great force, he's going to need some more men. So he sends a runner back. He sends Richard Harris back. Har Harris was, um, was in 12 platoon. 
And um, he, he wrote a fantastic account of the action that's in the book. He actually wrote free, he wrote a brilliant account for D-Day and for the later battle at, um, at Tinchbray. But Harris goes back, he tries to follow the route as much as possible that he's done, um, half running, half staggering, half sweating as he describes it, you know, and he goes up around the back of Le Petit Lande and tries to get back and try and find um, Lieutenant Archdale. And by this point, he finds Archdale somewhere probably just on the corner of where we were on, on the edge of Dead Cow Field. And Archdale comes forward and agrees to try and reinforce the position. But over on the other side in C Company, so C Company have pretty much come up roughly to the same sort of line of that hedgerow that goes along the back of the chateau. They've got themselves in there. And the first thing that unfortunately they encounter is they encounter these German tanks, these German tanks that suddenly appear from the low ground behind um, the chateau and straight away you know what do we do so so um C captain brown gets them down as much as possible he sees a tank over on the left which he actually thinks is an allied tank so himself he goes bounding up to this tank banging on the side of the turret hoping that he can get some help until he turns around and discovers that actually it's a german tank and he has a, a bit of a, a complete vault fast back into the nearest slit trench as the, as the tanks pass by it's here really that, that the great gallantry of C Company is seen. So, so Arthur Woodward, who, who's, um, who's commanding 14 platoon, he sees the opportunity here. He grabs a pit with, um, with another chap and they head out almost to the, end, to the extreme end of that hedgerow and they try and fire at the tank. He scores a direct hit um, and the tank withdraws. And then later on, another chap by the name of Private Crick, he picked up the pit, fired the second round and he got the tank beside it. So. Straight away, the, the, the two German tanks pull back, which allows C Company to move a little bit further forward into the chateau and make some defensive positions in that corner. So Duncan's pointing out uh, bullet holes or what could be bullet holes in the wall there. And in a minute, Duncan, I'll have you show back the view across across the field because Matt and Mag is about to drive very slowly. I'll just show you on a map. Um, what Mag is going to be doing and to give you an idea those watching just sort of the open well they look at the amazing bullet holes there and um, again we're bringing all this stuff to you live on the day 76 years on but let me show you what Mag, Mag is going to be driving uh, so I'll bring up the map uh, Mark's map and this map is in in Mark's book of course so uh, actually no I'll show the Google I'll show the Google Earth image hang on hang on changing my mind um, Mag was parked here and she's now going to take the drive down this farm track very slowly and then drive on down to the Pomeray down here. So just by doing that drive there, get across, because when you go skimming over this on Google Earth, those fields don't look very big. But when you're seeing it driving slowly, they are it's an enormous space. And there's a whole lot of open air behind it. So the East Yorkers are coming out of this kind of way. And um, it, the bit behind the little Londale has all been swallowed up by corn now, so that's not very authentic. But um, let me see what Mag is doing. Is Mag driving yet? Uh, yep, she's driving now. So, and then Duncan, hold where you are for a minute, and we'll just keep it on, on Mag for a bit, just to get an idea of just how huge that expansive field is. And remember, it really hasn't changed very much at all, this bit, the bit the other side of the chateau has. So, um, as Mark has been telling us, you know, two, two companies moving across that, although with heavy heavy casualties. So um, I'll hand back to Mark now and um, I'll shut up. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's, it's now that the, the first German infantry attack comes on in B Company's area. So whilst they're dug in around the chateau, the, the German enemy come, come or the, the Germans come on their infantry in, in quite sizable force. Um, the, the Suffolk's um, repel them as much as possible, but it really is almost a hopeless case. And at that point, McCaffrey's wounded. McCaffrey takes a, um, a bullet wound to, um, to, the, to, the, to the left side of the chest. It narrowly misses his, um, his lung. And he looks round once he's sort of managed to capture himself or get, get himself off the floor. And he realises and he sees a lot of his chaps actually bowing to the inevitable and surrendering. Um, so he realises, well, he doesn't want to go in the bag with them. And he, beside him is Lieutenant Evans. And Lieutenant Evans has been wounded um, in, in the hip. So the pair of them take a header into the nearest thorn bush, which was probably somewhere along where um, Duncan is at the moment, along the wall of the chateau. And they remain there probably for the best part of two or three hours in incredible pain as the Germans come on, come back, drive, drive the Suffolk's back over the wall to, to the, um, the bank behind. It, it's then... Um, that, um, that Harris appears 
um, with Captain Arstall and the reinforcements. And Arstall is pretty much thrown into the void. He has no idea if McCaffrey's dead. He has no idea if he's wounded. He, he certainly doesn't know that he's, he's hiding probably less than 20 foot away from him on the other side of the wall in the gorse bush. Um, so Arstall decides, well, rather than throw more men at it, what we'll do is we'll try and make a, a, a bigger attack. We'll try and see if we can get D Company up as well. So they send a runner back to try and get D Company. Um, in, in that short space of time, there's other little bits going on. C Company are fighting over right in the far corner. Um, they've, they've taken quite a, quite a bad pounding from those tanks, but they're now sort of getting themselves dug in and they're starting to inch ever so slightly forward. So in a way, the, 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 the Suffolk's line on, in C Company's area has started to, to, to come forward a bit. Um, now that the tanks are sort of out, now that the, um, that the, um, the, 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 peer, the peer crew have done their, their, their trick, um, it leaves a bit of a lull and the lull allows D Company to come forward. So, so D Company follow the edge of Dead Cow Field down past the back of Le Petit Lande and they start to dig in in the area between Le Petit Lande and the Chateau Wall. So this is, um, this is Major Papillon, Philip Papillon, he's, he's there. Um, and they find a, a series of, um, of partly finished German sort of slit trenches and they start to dig in as quick as possible. It's then that the next major sort of German mortar stomp comes over. And it catches um, it catches D Company pretty much fair and square. And the the, the accounts are that um, you know when the dust and the zing had, had, had settled, um, when they looked across to um, to, to, to to Le Petit Land, it was nothing but a but a scene of carnage. I mean, pe people um, people. I mean, Papillon, Papillon was mortally wounded. He's um, he's Batman. Um, was on the uh, on the edge of the slit trench, and his um, radio operator, which was Private Hammond, who was operating the 18 set, was was badly wounded as well and later died. So, communication with D Company and, and Battalion HQ has broken down, but at least D Company are close now. They're within 50 to 60 yards of the Chateau Wall. So, really, it's a question of them holding them in respective positions, working out the situation, and then they decide that what they'll do is they'll make another attack over the wall into the chateau. So C Company are already making bounds. B Company held up momentarily, but then sometime around about noon, they, they go over the, the, the wall and they start to, um, to move up towards the chateau itself. And it's, it's probably about another 50 to 60 yards between the wall itself and the actual chateau. And in between that zone, um, all the trees have, have been knocked down by shell fire. There's, there's incomplete slit trenches. There's fellas from some of the early attack who are wounded, who are still there. The, the Germans by this stage have pretty much got to grips with the fact that the chateau is going to fall. So they're making a sort of a calculated withdrawal south. There's a series of buildings on the southern side of the chateau at La Pomeraire. Um, this was actually where the, the family had lived during the war years. Um, Monsieur um, Formignier, who, who, who owned the chateau, gave it over to the Germans as a billet during the war. And um, in fact, I think Krug, who was Hillman's commander, this was actually his, his billet for, for most of the duration. So oh. the Germans start that sort of calculated, gentle withdrawal back. Um, this, this allows um, B Company to get in and, and to, to start clearing around the chateau, clearing around the back of the chateau. But all of the time, the, the, the Germans are still sending after mortar stonk after mortar stonk and this is taking casualties um, and then early in the afternoon uh, the Germans bring another load of tanks up they bring another load of tanks up um, to have a second attack but luckily um, the allied artillery at that point is, is capable of putting down a bit of a box barrage that sort of diverts their attention and they, they think better of it and move away but the final big stonk of early afternoon is, is, the, is the big costly one. It, it, it costs um, the life of um, Lieutenant Archdell and, um, and CSN Broom. They were both together. It, they, they, they could only unfortunately be identified by the badges of rank on their battle dress. But once the stonk was over, it allowed Evans and McCaffrey, who'd been hiding in the form bush, to pull back. They managed to get back, get back to D Company's positions in the field south of Le Petit Land from where they could use one remaining wireless set that had been brought up in the meantime to contact Battalion HQ. So at least now at that point, Lieutenant Colonel Kit Goff had actually got an understanding of roughly where his men were because he couldn't see in the chaos and confusion what was going on. So he knew that D Company were at Le Petit Land, he knew that B, 
B Company were actually in the Chateau's grounds itself. And he wasn't sure about C Company, but he knew that they'd moved off on the left flank and they were probably somewhere to the left hand flank of B Company. So if you're looking where you're looking at the moment, you're looking probably pretty much in between the boundary lines between B Company moving forward to the Chateau and C Company behind the camera. I think there's a, is it a form of cattle grid or something? There's a big, big shallow ditch at the back of the, the chateau, which I think was there at the time. Um, <clears throat> it's a moat. It's actually a moat. The, the account is moat, a moat, yeah. yeah. And in fact, yeah. I just I want to interrupt you for a second there, uh, Mark, because when Mag was driving, I noticed there's a view from right now that gets much more of an idea of the chateau being on a salient. You see how the rise is there? And if yeah, you pan a bit to the left, Mag, because now you're halfway across the field, you should better see across the car now. Is that right, Mag? If you go left a bit, yeah, you can see more of car over there now. See, see how we're that much higher now. So she's halfway. Across. I'll just show you on the map where Mag is. She's about, I guess, she's about here somewhere. So halfway across. So I think it's hard. I want you to get across to those watching that there is this bit of high ground. We've also had the comment from Sean Coldicutt saying where there's the, a big second KSLI action going on uh, on the forward slopes of Levis, Levisey Wood. Yes, they're, they're involved as well. And East York, South Banks. Um, I say it's a divisional day going on. And there's the 15 Scottish doing their stuff near the Odon. So there's a hell of a lot happening. We're going to focus on that one, but, um, but yes, of course, we acknowledge there's lots of other units involved in desperate scraps as well. But that view there, Mag is showing now, I think really gets across the idea of it. If you pan the back slowly to the right again, Mag, you can see there's the hospital again. If you go swing to the right, Mag, and you'll see back to the chateau, you'll see now be a better idea of it being on this little, just this little, little bump. And you can understand why the Germans wanted to be there. If I cut to Duncan now again, and if you show the, can you see, can you see Mag, Mag, the van where Mag is? Can you see across to where Mag is by any chance, Duncan? I'm just wondering whether you can see Mag. Or are you all in, in, incapacitated on a wall? But um, I think Duncan's died. Um, yeah, and I brought, I brought up the, show, the photo of the chateau during the war for you, and I'll bring that up again later. But... Um, Duncan seems to have frozen on that image there. I'll put it back on Mag for a second, see what happened to Duncan. Um, but yeah, there's the view. You can carry on now, Mag. Thanks very much. If you carry on around to La Pomeray now, the, the, the second location, I think we've got the idea of the salient now, which is nice. Let's see what Duncan's up to. I think, no, that, can you show back towards where Mag is, Duncan? Or are you, are you unable to do that from where you are right now? Uh, no, I don't know what's going on there. Well, perhaps carry on for a second, Mark, and we'll... Uh... Okay, well, <clears throat> that, I mean, that, the, the, the last final stong that, that takes out Art, Stoll and Broom is, is the most ferocious. And by that point, as I said, you know, the, the Germans have already sort of, you know, concluded that they're going to have to, you know, leave the, leave the position. Um, it's at that point that, that, that Kit Goff decides, well, he's got three, he's got three companies forward. He'll send a company forward to assist wherever possible. Bear in mind, A Company have taken a bit of a pounding on D-Day, but by the end of the day, they are actually the only company out of the four infantry companies of one Suffolk who are capable of holding off any form of counterattack. Um, also as well, as, um, as D Company hold, hold the area um, to the, the extreme north of the chateau on the chateau wall in the corner, with the East Yorks holding um, the ground in front, um, Goff decides the best thing to do as well would be to bring up the anti-tank platoon. So he, he calls the carriers forward with the six pounder guns of the anti-tank platoon to, to get into that area and to, to make good at least a position somewhere on the, um, on the wall of the chateau should any German counter-attack come later on that day. Um, it's really at that point that the, the battalion start to, um, partic particularly B Company, start to what's left of them to try and start to clear the chateau. Um, they hear a lot of moaning and groaning coming from the chateau. It turns out to be a wounded German who's, um, who's, on, who's on the steps, lying on the steps. And when they get into the cellar, they actually find two other Germans holding about half a dozen men of the East Yorks prisoner. And seeing that the chateau is going to fall, they quite politely surrender and, and the chaps are released. But, um, but by this time in the afternoon, as it's gradually winding down and the German fire is gradually receding. You can start to, Goff starts to see a picture of just 
the carnage and the chaos and the losses that have happened over the sort of previous 10 hours of the battle. He's, he's looking at B Company being probably less than a third of its strength. C Company was probably down to about a quarter of its strength. D Company had lost its commander. B Company had lost its commander. C Company's commander was wounded. It was a real, real battle of attrition. And, and the losses were just on paper form, trying to make a note of them as the fellows were brought into the regimental aid, regimental aid post was enough. Um, C Company... The fellas in C Company who drag their comrades back over the back. I mean, if you in the book you talk Ken Wright of C Company, I mean he managed to drag a fella back um, over his shoulder, got him back to the regimental aid post, and he was about to go back until the MO collared him and said, "You're going nowhere, mate. You know, there's no point you going back to that." Um, it was chaos and confusion all round. But by the middle of the afternoon, they were in, they were digging in, and they were being able to be reinforced in strength by A Company. But it was a tough nut and a tough nut that they'd cracked. But that's not to say that the South Flanks hadn't had that a week earlier. You know, their, their attack on the on the 20, early on the 27th to try and get in there. I mean, Eddie Jones, who was who was um, later, I think he was a platoon commander, or might have been company commander with, with first South Flanks. I mean, if you read his account of it, it is equally as ferocious a battle for them as it is for one Suffolk. I mean, the, the, the tipping point probably is that the, the South Lanks, when they were moving in, Epsom had only just begun or, or, or hadn't even begun yet. So now at this point, the Germans are a little bit more jumpy. And so it, may, it often doesn't need much of a difference to swing a battle. And it just a slight bit of more apprehension on the German side. And maybe that was enough to nudge it up and give the Suffolk the advantage that day that the South Lanks hadn't had in the previous days, it doesn't need a fine margin can make a huge difference. Absolutely. And as we've said on other of these World War II TV things, every day that passes for the Germans in Normandy, they are losing vehicles. They are losing vehicles, not just the tanks. They're losing their soft skins in the convoys coming up. They're running out of supplies. They're running out of artillery uh, uh, shells and what have you. So each day they engage, they are a weaker force. The reality for the for the Allies is. Although we are, of course, losing um, uh, uh, men on a large level, we have other units coming in behind to replace these men. We have tanks coming in. On the South Lanks attack on the 22nd, three crocodile tanks, Churchill crocodiles, pushed across the field and one, one was lost. But we can replace that within a couple of days. If the Germans lose a Panzer IV here, that's it. That's, that, that unit never gets a replacement tank for that. So you've got to always consider that bigger that bigger picture as well. Duncan, apparently he's lost his earpiece. So that's why he can't hear me anymore. So I've got to <laughs> message him. I've good luck finding it in a wheat field, Duncan. Not that he can hear me now. So I can say horrible things about him now. But he's coming well, to a barbecue later on. Well, um, there you go. That's exactly like it was 76 years ago. We've lost communication. Lost communications, yeah. I'll just... And of course, what they were trying to do late in the day um, was to lay out wires for, for field telephones and trying to get direct link between sets. So it's, uh, it's replicating what happened on the day. Yeah, exactly. We've only got four people to coordinate and two of us are sitting in office chairs So, um, <laughs> and no one's shooting at us. So uh, it, is, it is fascinating stuff and um, uh, all for just one field. And um, I'm going to you know, reiterate some things I've said before. That our idea with World War II TV is not just to cover, although we will do some, if you like, popular battles, is to cover these ones that I'm sure some people watching this had no idea this battle even took place because if they are looking at reading about the British Army in Normandy on this day, they're reading about what's hap happening near the Odon because there is a larger scale operation than this. But for one Suffolk and for the KSLI and for South Langs and East York, this was a terrible, terrible couple of days. And that's not always um, how it can, um, uh, can, 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 I've lost my train of thought there. It's, you know, we're trying to get these smaller engagements covered. So I'll, I'll let Mark carry on. There's some questions coming in on, on, on YouTube as well. Um, that, that, so Duncan's working his way around to the same place where I'll put Mag's view on now. Mag is over um, uh, facing towards where Duncan is coming from that tree line over towards the far right there. And um, I'll hand back to Mark and I'll look at the questions coming in. Well, no, I think it's, it's, it's a good point you've, you've just made because, I mean, when, when Eric Lummis wrote his book in 94, One, One Suffolk in Normandy, the, the, the one phrase in there that absolutely put, you know, the chill down the spine of your back was he said, there were other battles going on which attracted more attention. And I think that was how most of the old boys 
certainly throughout the 80s and the 90s, viewed their part in the campaign. I think that, as you say, you know, Epsom was going on. The press were having a lot of coverage in other areas. It was a big tank battle for the first time, you know, and the lowly infantry attacks that have been going on every day since landing in Normandy. This was just another one of those. It didn't really demand any more great special attention in the press or the media of the day than anything else. But a major big, you know, assault, which was what Epsom was, you know, was the thing that was going to grab the headlines. People could actually see something big was moving forward. And I think that that's one of the most important things about the battle. The old boys did think it was the, the, the toughest nut. I mean, as you, you've said in, in the opening, you know, um, the grimmest smile in France, I think the Sunday pictorial of the day after or whatever um, described it as, and later on it was known as, the, you know, the bloodiest square mile in Normandy, which to be fair, it probably is. Yeah, um, yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's always, it's not about competition. It's not saying that battle A is worse than the battle B. It's just shedding some light on some battles that perhaps people don't always think of at first glance and uh, and giving a bit of attention to some of these actions that in the grand scheme of things happening on June the 28th weren't monumental but in for, for a, a lad from Barry St Evans in the 1st Battalion Suffolk Regiment this was probably one of the worst days of his entire war if not the very worst day and the, we'll, come, we'll, we'll, we'll cover the casualties and things later on. Um, so Duncan and, and Mag are getting close to being uh, in the same spot fairly soon um, I'm just checking any more questions coming in. Um, in fact, Sean Colicott, I kind of misread what he said earlier when he was saying that um, the, the, the KSLI were, were dealing with their own problem, but they recorded the Suffolk's battle at La Londe in their own war diaries. It was so, it was so pivotal. So, um, you know, they're, they're referencing that each other are having it fairly tough that day. So, um, um, so Mag is standing at the, uh, I'll show you where on the map those watching where Mag is. So Mag is down in the corner, see the, the, the kind of arrow shaped roads here. Well, Mag is standing here just under where Mark's title Chateau de Londe is. And the bit south of where Mag is, is all very much changed or changing. Even since Mark was last year, last year for the 75th, it's changing. There's a new road uh, being built. Um, if you show around behind you, Mag, you show the new road over there that's going in, just to give an idea. Oh, but I think Mag is showing us the, the, the broken walls there. But if you show behind us, Mag, you'll see how the bit beyond is, is building up substantially. And there's a cross towards Caen again. And there's a new road. Where's the road over? See there, if you hold the camera there, Matt, that's it. There's a sort of that bit there is a new road going through the middle, so cutting through the sway there. So the Epron area, which was sort of the objective, is is kind of being swallowed up by Caen. Um, and indeed, for those watching this, that's one of the difficulties with the, with coming to Normandy and seeing the battlefields of the British Third Division, is places like Lebesy Wood have been swallowed up to a large extent by Caen. Combon Plain is kind of still quite original in the middle, but it's expanded around the battlefield. That's hard to sometimes get your, your bearings in there. All those buildings there, of course, that would have been fields. That is all just the expansion of Caen over the last 76 years. Um, so we're lucky that um, the actual bit in on the north of the battlefield, the approach, the, the battle line is all still as it was, but the bit, the objectives, if you like. And you can see also at that point there that Mag is now standing on this salient because the ground drops off a little bit before Caen again. So you can understand why the Germans had hold, held that position with that bit of height advantage there. Um, so we have a question coming in from Sheldrake 6, and I'll ask Mark this. Did the Suffolks had forward observers attached, or was the creeping barrage the only artillery support? I believe it was the only artillery support available. Um, certainly none of the old boys remembered any form of artillery observer. Um, but late in the day, the, the observers come forward, because obviously once you've captured the chateau and you've got that high building on the ridge, the, the artillery spotters are really keen to make use of it as soon as possible. Um, but certainly in the opening phases, uh, in the opening phase of the attack, there's no um, mention. And certainly I don't remember any of the old boys talking about having having anyone from the artillery there. Well, I mean, I think that's po po possibly because of just the shortage of forward observation officers, because we had lost so many on June the 6th and it was quite a I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the length of training a forward obser observation officer would receive, but it's, it's it's substantial because they've got to be aware of infantry tactics, artillery tactics, communications, and we'd lost lots. So I, I would imagine that by this point, towards the end of June 1944, there aren't many spare uh, foos around in the whole second army, let alone um, attached to a battalion level. 
So um, I'd be intrigued to know if everyone knows the answer to that more. But I, yeah, I, I, in my reading, as I was reading where I was letting Mark do the Suffolk stuff, I was reading East Yorks and South Banks and what have you. And I found no mention of forward observation officers at all. So it could just be there weren't any by that point. Um, just like the fact there aren't many accounts of the Germans and exactly how many Germans were around as well. So Duncan is showing us kind of the back end of the, uh, uh, the chateau there as well. Um, so yeah, one, a one day battle and we're, 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 this is not gonna be an incredibly long broadcast this because Mark's got to travel on uh, going off for of work uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, you know, we, we didn't want to ramble on too much about this. I'm just another question coming in multi time. That's just uh, referencing the other units again. So um, uh, tell us about the, the as, as, as things wound down. So about this time of day, 76 years ago, so we're talking seven evening things had had calmed down. Had we covered the fact there was a potential German counterattack that didn't happen? Have we got that far? Um, no, no, we hadn't. I mean, the um, as I say, the, the anti-tank platoon have been brought up. They've, they've started to dig in in preparation for anything that could happen. Um, the, the infantry have, have, have moved ever so slightly forward in, in, the, in the orchard at the back of the chateau. And C, C and, and B and C companies are certainly at the southern edge. Um, so they've effectively started a perimeter of, high, of, of the high ground round the, round the back of the chateau and round the underside of it. The, the minefield that you can see on the map there was laid pretty much immediately afterwards. The, the battalion pioneers and that came in, they were very keen to, to, um, to start some form of um, defensive line. And they remain in the chateau grounds and the area around it pretty much for the next week or so when they're pretty much constantly under fire because of course all the time they can be seen they're on the high ground the germans can see them from from the dip in con um and they take pretty much more constant casualties i mean fellas coming up delivering rations they say that it got to the stage where you know you could get to the final slit trench and then you would be throwing the, the ration tins from trench to trench to get to the fellas in the front line because it was so so dangerous to go forward in the open above above ground because they were all still in open sites of the german positions um but by the end of the day on the 28th um they've pretty much got the entire battalion there a company have come up a company have um have reinforced where possible um, C Company ha have gone. D, D Company were very badly mauled um, between Le Petit Land and, and the Chateau Wall, um, but but there was still a fair fair amount of them that came up. So late on late in the afternoon or sort of early evening, Goff decides that he'll have a bit of a quick reorganisation, and he basically splits D Company up between B and C. So at least they've got some form of forward defensive line should anything happen. But in, in terms of, you know, losses at the end of the day, um, one Suffolk have, you know, have lost about 40, 42 men killed. There's over 110 wounded, although to be honest, in, in the research I've done more recently, I would think that's probably more like 150 because there are confusions and conflictions with the casualty list. I mean, there's one in the war diary. There's, there's one in the regimental gazette, of which when you look at it, it certainly appears that there were more men wounded there than we give them credit for. Um, and there were chaps captured for the first time. I mean, I mean, B Company lost 12 fellas. I mean, um, 12 platoon lost four, 11, um, 11 platoon lost one, um, uh, 10 platoon lost six, you know, fellas who, who had been fighting those little set piece actions when mm. the Germans came that were just swallowed up, you know, um, McCaffrey being, being lucky managed to, to get out and hide for the, for, for, the, for, the, um, for the duration before he could get back. But it really was a big loss to the battalion. I mean, you've got, you got the situation in A Company where A Company had lost its commander on D-Day. It had then had a, a second in command that was wounded. Then it had a further um, commander that had come um, mid-June. B Company had lost its commanding officer, uh, or it had its commanding officer wounded and its second in command killed. It lost two of its CSMs. The same was over in C Company. Um, it had a, its company commander wounded. It had lost um, three of its senior um, CSMs killed, CSM Lancaster was killed trying to um, trying to help an anti-tank gun over the wall into the chateau and um, when he was killed by a mortar stonk um, and D Company had lost its commander and um, Philip Papillon had gone um, and he he was really the bitter the bitter loss I mean he was a pre-war officer he'd been he'd been a contemporary of McCaffrey they they both served in the second battalion in India but but to lose that many so quick and in such a short ferocious battle it really did leave the battalion completely depleted 
And of course, at that stage, you know, there were very little reinforcements. There were no reinforcements left. So in the days following the battle, they're kept at the chateau. They're kept there. You know, they're not ordered to move on anywhere. And, and it's a chance really for those first major batch of reinforcements to come out from the UK. Um, the 8th Battalion that had been been formed in late 1940 had then become a, a sort of a holding battalion that had trained fellas up to go to other units of the regiment. And certainly in the middle of middle of June, um, they were getting ready for the call. But after the Chateau, there's over over 120 of them that arrive in the sort of week following the action in early July. Um, but but it but it's costly. You know, it, it is it is the costliest campaign or the costliest um, action that one suffered for in in the whole of the Northwest Europe campaign. And and what they what they never recovered from after it was the loss of all the old soldiers. I mean. There was a very high proportion of those in B Company that had been old pre-war Second Battalion fellows who'd served in India. You know, people like Harry Jockel, Wilf Crisp, um, um, CSM Lancaster, I just mentioned in C Company. You know, they're, they're all time served regular soldiers. You know, these are fellows who'd been up on the northwest frontier. You know, at, um, at Razmac in 1939, they got the India General Service with the, with, with the northwest frontier bar. They'd done internal security in India in the early days, and then they'd been called back called back to England, they'd done a bit of bit of training, bit of bit of acclimatization, and then they were straight out with the first battalion on D-Day. So that was one of the bitterly felt losses, all of those old sweats who got all that um, enthusiasm to keep the young, you know, mm. called up um, conscripts and militia men in line um, with the loss of those and 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 the and the senior officers. It really was a, a really weakened battalion by the end of the day. And and just to give some context again for those watching um, this was Operation Mitten, the taking of the chateau, and this this salient was Operation Mitten. And although Mark has been explaining in great detail, thank you very much, Mark, the the taking of it and and the cost for the battalion. Uh, at, back at kind of brigade level, it has not been considered that this gain of ground has been quite um, strong enough to launch a second uh, 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 operation because Operation Abalor was going to be a Canadian. 9th Brigade and the British 9th Brigade operation to seize on a bit of ground. Beyond. I'll bring up the uh, the um, the map again, the first Google map map, and this was a plan to seize. Um, no, I think I want the previous one. That one. so um, Epon, Saint Contest, Mathieu, and Sa and uh, you got places like um, Oti and Galmanche over here, and uh, that was to be. You know, it came almost immediately after this for Operation Mitten was over, um, but it was considered at a higher level that the, the the tenuous link they have on the Chateau grounds was not strong enough to launch another attack immediately after. So Operation Abalor got um, well cancelled effectively, and it wasn't as Mark was saying there until the first week of July, so a few days later, the Charnwood, which becomes the push for Caen, ends up replacing Abalor and the British and the Canadians all start moving in conjunction towards Caen. So this, this has not been a a, a, a success as such. It's it's a it's a it, we've gained some ground, but at a high cost of infantrymen. And as Mark has so incredibly eloquently said, that we can't replace. So it's it's not it's a victory, but it's a very hollow. Um, shallow victory i'm sure the guys of one suffolk sitting around that evening so 76 years on tonight tonight would not be thinking oh my god we kicked some german ass today they'd have been thinking oh my god how many of our buddies are lying back in that wheat field um uh, so yeah it was a it was a very very costly battle so mag has just um arrived at the front of chateau de la londe uh to show us that both the chateau as it is today and um the monument that's there as well. So I'll put I'll put um, Mag on spotlight there. So there's a chateau with its typical French, you know, tree lined driveway. And I'll bring up a couple of photos again we have of the chateau just after the battle. And there in the description of this video on YouTube is a link to a two minute Imperial War Museum clip taken after this battle, kind of hours after this battle was over. I can't include Imperial War Museum footage in my commercial videos but i can link to it and you can watch that immediately after this you'll see these areas you'll see men of the suffolks and east yorks are milling around and there's a sort of a sniper platform and a tree you'll see so watch that later. there's a chateau there and i'll bring up the photos um so this one is from mark from his books you can see the damage 
and that's the other side. That's the, the other side. That's, is it or is that the front? I'm this is the front. front. This that's is the front, front, yeah, with the damage on the roof there. And then there's the other one, which is, I'll bring that up. The other side there with the damage uh, matching up there and uh, from the wall. But 1951, it was fully um, repaired. So it took sort of seven, six, seven years. There's that one there as well, showing the corner. And the owners of the chateau is private property, but they're, they're, they're pretty interested in history. There's a photo album inside the grounds there that they will show to guests. I know British veterans who've been there over the years always seem to receive a warm welcome. I would stress to people visiting Normandy, don't just walk in, of course. You know, you've got to kind of knock on a door and make appointments and things, but they are very interested in what happened there. And I we've got this other photo that Mark gave me. So Mark will give me the story of this one here. So tell us about that one there, Mark. Okay, well, this is, <clears throat> this is the original cross at what was known as Suffolk Cemetery. So in the days following the battle, as the battle moved on and it got a lot easier to start to bring in the dead, to start to clear up the carnage, to start to get, get away and to you know, make a better position of the place, they, they create what's known as Suffolk Cemetery. So here you see, this is the only known photo that we have of it. This is the original cross that was made by um, by Alec Rayleigh of the, of the Pioneer Platoon from T Timbers Salvage from the Chateau. And it was basically where you um, you were looking earlier at the back of the Chateau, where the sort of the part of the moat was. If you looked over there towards the Chateau wall at about 45 degrees, it was a, it was a single track trench that, that all, all of the bodies of one Suffolk were put in. So literally they... Um, they congregated them there. They 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 pulled them all pulled all together in a, in a mass grave, and then later they were moved either to to Hermanville or to Duval or Delivermont. And I, I, it's a it's a funny split. The, the majority of them are in um, in in Duvra, but there's quite a few in Hermanville. I don't know whether one cemetery got too big and they decided to put the overflow into the other. I, I'm not sure, but. I've was, lived here for years and trying to understand why some people go to one cemetery some yeah. another is a, is a constant confusing battle. I think ultimately with everything that was going on, there wasn't much thought given given the, the roads and ambulances and the, the units to try and group people together because you get that with every battle. You know, they seem to split the with the, with Villa Bacard today. Some are in, in uh, um, Langev, some are in Tilly sur some are in... Um, the other one I forgot, which is, is so, you know, you think, why didn't they just take them to one battlefield? But it's just that the, the needs as they were there. So Mag is now showing us the monument. Was it Duncan? No, it's Duncan is showing us the mo one of one of them is <laughs> it's showing us the actual monument. That's the, well, that's now the, the view to the shadow on the other side. But there's the one of you is going to show us the actual monument. I know you showed us a minute ago, but we are. Uh, so one of you, Duncan or Mag, show us the view of the actual monument when you can. There's no rush. Um, and so, Mark, let's I mean, just in case where people are missing it. Um, the battalion would have been, um, you know, what, 850 on D-Day or yeah, a bit less about than that? that. Yeah. Uh, but they'd already suffered some losses even before they got here. I mean, there'd have been some replacements coming through. But they wouldn't have started this for anything like full strength, would they? No, I mean, this. I, I, I think from, from, from looking at it, there'd have probably been about, you know, 700, 7, 780, something, or somewhere about that strength. I mean... Like I say, bear in mind, there's quite a few fellas wounded on D-Day and um, the, the battalion commander on D-Day, Dick Goodwin, he's wounded at Le Mesnil Wood. And there's several um, chaps who are, who, are, who are casualties in the meantime. But the first real big batch of reinforcements is after the Chateau. Well, there's the, there's the monument to the Suffolk Regiment there, the Chateau de la Lonne. Uh, Mag is showing us that, and um, yeah, so the the, lo the losses that day were, were you know, twenty five percent plus uh, killed. I mean, it's that's that's horrific, uh, and um, and we I've just I, I I'm watching the comments coming in, Mark, and we've got a relative of Captain Brown watching, which is very nice. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, there was someone else. Uh, yeah, Captain Ralph Brown's granddaughter is watching. Um, oh, yeah, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, so in fact, that's our fourth live stream in a row where we've had a relative of someone uh, from the battle watching, which is just so encouraging to me to make me want to do more of these because the idea that people are inter interacting live with us is just absolutely extraordinary and well, well, um, makes me uh, uh, want to do more and more of these. So there's uh, Mag showing us the uh, the. Um, information panel the light is going to be really bad for us to get a view of that duncan is showing the view yeah we're, we're not we can just read that mag the battle for the chateau de londe 
and we're getting several people say thanking us for giving a, a putting a spotlight on this relatively little known battle i mean i don't think it's a little known battle really but it is um there were two two granddaughters watching i've been corrected there were two watching so that's very nice um so uh, that's brilliant and roman is a french tour guide he's one of my camera team he's saying are there books available about the british fighting north of corn the answer is you have to kind of go regiment by regiment don't you really there isn't there's there's um norman where was there? there's the third division assault division history which is quite good but um obviously there's mark's book on the suffolks you've got things like um uh, gary Waite did his book on the lincolns there's a book on the rifles are here about the second battalion rules the rifles there's books about the south Langs. there's books about the east yorks but and then there's the battle zone and battleground europe books that have the battles for coin them i don't know off the top of my head how many of them cover these battles here but to be honest, I think it needs a nice, big, fat, juicy book with lots of aerial photos showing these battles. It'd be very interesting, I think. Well, there's the Suffolk Regiment insignia there on the uh, on the monument. So great, great photography there, Monk, uh, uh, Mag, and Duncan as well. Um, so um, I'm just checking if we've got any more questions coming in. I don't think... Uh, oh, no, we've got... Private A.E. Walker killed at the Chateau is, is someone's great uncle, I uh, think... He thinks this is, that's MW. He thinks his mum is watching too. So that's uh, another relative. Well, well, so that's, well, that, well that's, that, that, that's Mark Walker. That's that's Teddy Walker, who was in D Company. So so Ted, Teddy was killed not far away from Philip Papillon when the Great Storm right. comes down. Well, <laughs> this, this, this is so, it's so cool that people are actually watching it who oh, have relatives fantastic. involved in it. It's amazing stuff. Um, you know, books, books are fantastic, but this, this instant connection between people interested in the battle and the battlefield and the finest historians is just, is just so exciting for and me. Then, can I just go back to, you, you talked about the IWM footage, which is yeah. taken the following day. Yeah. But the, the chateau that features in it, when people go and look at it, is not the Chateau de la Londe, it's the Chateau at Le Petit Londe. The Petit Londe, yeah, good. yeah, yeah. So, so when, when you see, when they see the film, um, you will see almost a reverse angle. It's the camera. The cameraman is at the chateau wall, and you see a couple of fellas jump into um, into the, the the bank by the wall, and they're looking across to to, to Le Petit Long, which was never rebuilt. But then the the film, if I remember it rightly, it cuts to a fella shaving and another fella who's um, a Bren gunner with his number two digging a. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That is at the track at the back of the chateau. So, okay. so where we were with that partial moat is roughly where that piece of film was taken. Brilliant. Oh, look, Mag has got an artistic shot of a shot of a poppy there. Good work, Mag. You've done this before, haven't you? Yeah, perfect. Um, so um, I think we're kind of coming to an end on this one. In that um, we we discussed the fact that the this was a, a a victory, but it's come at a heavy cost, and it leads to Operation Abalor being cancelled. And and in fact, the British don't move out again from this area really for another week or so. And we probably will cover that. In another live stream, Ben Main is interested in coming on and doing a port talk, focusing on the East Riding Yeomanry. He, he also reminded me today they were coming through and mopping up the chateau late on June the 28th. So basically, any, any unit with or attached to the Third Division came past this chateau at some point over two or three days. It, it's hmm. it's a blink and you miss it part of the suburbs of Caen, frankly, these days if you don't know anything about it. But for the Third Division, it was a huge. Um, hurdle in their progression towards Caen and even as we know units that didn't take part directly in the fighting for Lalonde were in were, were referencing it. my great uncle in the second battalion well lost the rifles when he would come over to Normandy he'd always talk about the Suffolks at uh, their big one his big one was in Combon Plain their big one here and you know when you drive these areas now it's a shame that so many um tourists they focus on they're going to Pegasus Bridge, Merville Battery, blah, blah, blah. Then they drive up to Saw Beach. Maybe they do Hillman. Maybe they do some monuments on Saw Beach. And then they tend to trundle along the coast towards Aramanche and Gold yeah. Beach. And that's all fine. But you're missing out all this area just north of Caen, where basically a month of combat of varying levels of success for the British and the Germans took place. And um, and we're privileged to, to bring this stuff to you. So um, I'll put well, it back on the monument there again, I think. I mean, I mean the, the, the monument's interesting because typical of oh. Suffolk soldiers throughout history who don't blow their own trumpet, it was actually quite hard work to get a monument there at all. I mean, that was unveiled in 94, which was, which was the sort of the third real big tour of the old boys going back. And 
it had mainly been driven by by Bill Deller, who was a um, who was a post Second War soldier, um, Brigadier Bill Deller, because he felt and quite rightly that they should be at least some kind of memorial at the chateau. The old boys themselves went there on the tours, looked and you know remembered it, walked through the grounds, but. But it took it took a lot of work, and I always think it's great because in '94, when um, BBC Look East accompanied the old boys on the tour, Martin Bell was with them, and Martin Bell was um, was one suffering in Cyprus in the late '50s national. Oh yeah, he was, wasn't he? Yeah. He, um, but he but he said at the end of the report, which I thought was excellent, was that um, of the Chateau de Londres, that there is some corner of a foreign field that is forever Suffolk, and I think that's very true. Yeah, wonderful words. And um, yeah, I actually met Martin Bell last year myself. Um, yeah, um, no, uh, it's it's a it's a small story in the grand scheme of things, but it's a massive story if you were someone who had who had who had been there. And hopefully, we've given it done it a bit of justice today. And um, and um, I can only recommend once again, Mark's. I'll bring up the image of the Mark's cover of his book. Um, <laughs> And someone, I saw a review of it. Someone saying it's very much like Band of Brothers. So if that, that's pretty high praise. If it's if it's got that sense of continuity of knowing the men, being compared to Band of Brothers as a book is is high praise, I think. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> it's um, fantastic stuff. So uh, for, and particularly, I don't know if there's any Americans watching this. It, reading about the British and the Canadians, I think, is something you you need to do a bit more of. I think generally, I'm not being. I'm not being um, picky there, but I think there's authors writing predominantly for an American audience. And I think understanding the role of the British is key to understanding the, the Battle of Normandy. You have to read it from all points of view, the British Canadians, the Americans, the air power, the naval involvement. It's all important to understand how bad the battle was and indeed the German side of things. So, well, there we are. I think, I think we've covered everything now. There's no more questions coming in. People have been very um, pleased with what we've done. Um, See, you were nervous, earlier, Mark. It was easy in the end, wasn't it? It's just, it's just talking. If, if know, you know, people like you and I, now. we could talk war all day long. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's fine. So um, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Um, I did a thumbs up for my camera team. Did you enjoy? It? Do you want to do a, do a selfie of yourself so we can see your thank you for your hard work, ladies and gentlemen? Go on, swing the cameras around on yourself. There we go. There's Mag. Hello, Mag. Well done. Perfect work Good. again. I'll get the barbecue lit when you're driving back. Don't worry. And Duncan, do we have to, can we see you as well? Or are you all red and sweating? I know you haven't got your, he hasn't got his audio. I've got to tell it. Yeah, he's got it. Yeah, there's his thumb. Well, that's been fantastic. So um, for those watching, join us again tomorrow night for our Air Power in Normandy with Canadian uh, Dr. Mike Bechtold, uh, Matt Bowe, another Canadian, but transplanted to London, talking about Second Tactical Air Force, and Adam Berry, who's written a couple of books about the 82nd Air Bomb, the troop carriers is coming on. We're going to debunk some myths about those C-47 pilots on D-Day. Talk about fighters, fighter bombers and bombers and the difference between what they are and the operations in Normandy. Aerial reconnaissance, talk about the, the importance of aerial reconnaissance. I'm sure going back to Mark's presentation earlier today when they were hand, huddling around those um, uh, lamps that someone was showing aerial photos. A lot of our, our planning of these, of these operations was shown by the aerial photos that our blue painted Spitfires are bringing back to our units regularly in the Battle of Normandy to explain where the Germans were. So there we are. Um, any closing words, Mark? Do you want to say anything to this, this audience while you've got them? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I think that's enough, really. I think we've covered everything. <laughs> I think we've done it pretty well, yeah. Um, Except that I, 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 I just hope if, it, if it's done nothing more, it will encourage people to go out, find out a bit more about it, and hopefully um, it will release some more accounts. It will release some more family memories, some anecdotes, things that we haven't uncovered that can piece some more bits of the jigsaw together. Absolutely. It's, um, it's all a learning curve. Um, the minute a book is printed, it's already out of date because someone will come along and go, oh, but yeah. you didn't mention that bit. And you go, oh, I didn't yeah. know that bit. I can do that in the next already edition. Happened. It's, it, it, yeah, it, it happened. I, th I think some, one friend of mine actually got more information to put in like the minute after he just yeah. submitted the final proof in this email yeah. magazine. Can, you, can I just say the set, a final, final, final proof? We had a one question saying, um, have battlefield relics been found in the air? Well, I know because Sean Claxton's watching it, who, who's, who's one of my team of guides. He was there with a, I forget which unit veteran he took there years ago, but I'm sure there was a Bren gun they had in the chateau they brought out of somewhere. Or I may be thinking about a different chateau, but I'm fairly sure no, there was a Bren um, gun. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, they've had a they've had a clear up over the last few years, but, but certainly um, when we went last year, um, they'd still got the Bren, 
They'd right, still got okay. some, some bits and bobs. Um, and the most lovely thing that they've got was the um, the original battalion sign. Um, the, the lady took us down in the cellar, and in the cellar there was um, all of the chalk still on the wooden doors of different officers who'd been there. Um, no Suffolk's, unfortunately, but I guess other chaps that came later. And um, we was we was in the in the cellar, and um, someone said, "What's that over there?" And as we held it up to the light, you could see the three D of triangle with fifty five, wow. and it was quite clearly a, a nighttime recognition sign of one Suffolk that had been found in the garden sort of ten years before. <laughs> Great stuff. So um, that's well, I think on that we'll bring this to an end. It's so fantastic that they are they are watching this, uh, relatives of people and. And Ralph Brown's granddaughter is saying that she has some marked up maps and letters if anyone would like to look at them. Absolutely. So, <laughs> yes, is the answer to that. So <laughs> thank you very much for watching. Um, I've been uh, Paul Woodad, as I always am. Mark has been Mark Forsdyke. Duncan and Mag have been our camera team. We brought you a little battle there and we'll plan more of these later on. And we can bring back Mark at some point in the future to talk about Tinspray or one of the other battles of the Suffolks. We can do a third div with some other historians. Who knows? But this has been good. And I've had fun. Mark's had fun. Duncan and Mag have had fun. So um, remember, click subscribe. Click the little, little bell so you get notifications of the future videos. If you'd like to consider being a Patreon, um, a patron of what we're doing here, that would be very gratefully appre appreciated. As I said in my broadcast last night, I made the decision last week, every single one of these shows is always going to be free to air on YouTube. I'm not holding back any special stuff. People who pay more money, it'll be free to everybody. I love the idea that 15 year old students can watch this, relatives of veterans. It shouldn't be something that only people who pay money should have access to. It's always gonna be free. So um, any any donations to help me going, because you have to pay for fuel, we have to pay for the cameras, these kind of things, it would be gratefully received. So on that note, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Mag. I will close out. And remember, keep the comments going in the videos below if you want to. And um, and Sean was reminding me it was a different chateau, and I was thinking of a, a SLI veteran. Well, that's the that's it. That's it, Sean. It's 20 years of memory. I'm getting my chateaus and my Bren guns mixed up, but whatever. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'll, I'll end the stream now, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Right, I've ended the stream.